turns out spending $100,000 on a JPEG doesn't actually mean you own it. Oh, shit. Awkward. Look, if you hold an NFT in your wallet, you own that NFT, but that doesn't mean you own the associated art. In fact, out of the top 25 projects on OpenSea today, only one even attempts to give you legal ownership of the associated artwork. One, and a damn show ain't the apes. The debate around how NFT collections handle IP rights is passionate to say the least. Perhaps the most divisive hot take on the IP versus CCO debate comes courtesy of NFT42 founder Jimmy Eth, who put it as capitalism versus communism. And given the difference in how each of these approaches affects monetization potential, I can see where such a generalization holds some merit, but solely focusing on the monetary aspects is short-sighted when considering the varied nuances. But why is this even relevant? Well, for better or worse, one of the core narratives contributing to the meteoric rise of NFTs is the assumption that only an NFT gives you ownership of whatever is linked or associated with it. Though certainly a use case, it's far from the only one. Since NFTs can grant ownership rights, and sometimes do, even if in limited fashion, the purpose or value of holding an NFT that doesn't grant IP rights gets confusing. The recent okie-doke from the Moonbirds project, Tiffany's creating punk's jewelry, and the Bay C Rider Rips lawsuit have each brought different IP rights issues to light, forcing the wider community to reassess the very essence and value of their NFTs. Ultimately, one central question remains on everyone's mind. Who owns the art? Now, as sticky as that question might be, I think I've got the answer for you. First, though, special thanks to Alex Modell, Max Kernan, and Jeremy Goldman for breaking a ton of this stuff down in an interview with Carly Riley on her show, Overpriced JPEGs, and to the team over at Galaxy.com for the phenomenal write-up they've done on the topic. Now, let's go ahead and dive in. We'll begin with IP rights. Intellectual property is merely a catch-all term to describe property rights related to non-physical assets. Accordingly, there are four main types of intellectual property. Copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. Given that copyright is the primary legally recognized form of IP for digital content, we'll focus our attention here. So note, whenever a project says you own the IP or have IP rights, copyright is what they're usually referring to. And a copyright, in practice, covers the expression that is fixed in a tangible medium, be it a painting, art, photos, motion pictures, video games, etc. Copyright ownership grants the owner the ability to exercise the exclusive rights, to authorize others to exercise any of those exclusive rights, and to prevent others from exercising any of those exclusive rights. More specifically, it allows the copyright holder the right to reproduce, distribute, publicly display, perform the work, and to create derivative works. Hence the name copyright. Thankfully, you don't need to file anything to obtain a copyright for your works. It exists once you create the work. However, if you need to enforce the protection of your copyright from infringement, aka sue somebody, you must file for copyright registration. Otherwise, you can't do much about it. Once granted, though, copyrights remain in effect for up to 70 years after the original author's death, at which point the work is entered into the public domain as it transitions to a CC0 work, something we'll touch on in just a second. So, legal hurdles and constraints aside, What's the beef between IP advocates and CC0 champions? The core thesis for those supporting the standard of NFT IP rights is the assumption that such rights directly incentivize holders to contribute productive, thoughtful, or creative applications to the underlying property, be it an ape, doodle, bad influence, or other work since they hold exclusive rights to capture any value created in that process. For example, Board Ape Yacht Club owners licensing their NFTs to star in virtual bands, Boss Beauty signing to WME, or otherwise leveraging the NFT for commercial means. Whether you plan to monetize your NFT or not, this article by Galaxy.com put it best, noting, quote, 
Without copyright, a purchaser of digital content does not own that content, but instead licenses that content from the copyright holder on terms dictated by the copyright holder. In this sense, the copyright holder, the licensor, is the digital content landlord, while the purchaser or licensee of that content is the digital content tenant. Well, that all seems pretty cut and dry, right? I mean, if a collection wants, can't they just grant their holders IP rights? Not exactly. Ensuring legal copyrights are transferred from the original author or artist to the project's creators and then onto the holders themselves can all be quite a process. According to 17 U.S.C. Section 204A of the Copyright Act, a valid transfer of copyright must be in writing and be signed by or on behalf of the transferring party. While it's common for projects to make an announcement regarding IP rights in their Discord or via Twitter, that's not a legally binding or enforceable transfer. Historically, such a transfer is executed via IP assignment agreement, the way Larva Labs did with Yuga Labs. But there are some teams working on making this a more seamless, yet legally sound on-chain process like the folks at Remaster.io. After you finish this video, be sure to check out my interview with their co-founders, Max Kernan and Alex Modell, if you want to learn more about what they're doing and how it works. I'll leave a link in the description. If we assume a legally binding full transfer of copyright ownership from the artist responsible for collections art over to the creators or company behind the project, the project can now bestow full copyrights to the holders. But they probably won't. Instead, what most projects do is issue what's known as a copyright license, a limited license specifically. This limited license ensures that the collection retains full copyright ownership, thus affording them the continued use of all associated art or other IP however they like. Though a finesse at first glance, there are some benefits to this limited approach. If as a holder, you want Yuga Labs or whatever project you're involved in to keep building out the ecosystem surrounding the collection, they have to keep the rights. Otherwise, what they would have to do is check with every holder before using their NFT's artwork in ads, merch, or even to create models within a virtual world like other side. Another major shortcoming of limited licensing is its revocability. Unless a copyright is transferred in whole without limitations, the original copyright owner can revoke your license at any time for any reason without notice. Just ask the Moonbird holders. If you happen to work a licensing deal allowing a brand or a business to use the artwork associated with your NFT, but then your rights are revoked, what does it mean for the deal? Even if a project claims to grant copyrights to you and never revokes those rights, you should pour through the terms of service and agreements to find out what rights are spelled out in the letter of the law. This due diligence is the only way to find out what sort of rights you have. The research team at Galaxy reviewed dozens of collections and found that most projects' terms grant holders one of four types of limited licenses. The first is commercial rights. With this, you can monetize the artwork freely with no cap on revenue in any venue or format for any length of time. This uh, example is shown by Azuki's. Second is limited commercial rights, where you can monetize the artwork to a certain amount of revenue in limited formats and venues and for specified periods of time. This often applies to uh, dollar amounts ranging around 100k in merchandise sales, for example. Look at doodles for something like this. The third is personal use, meaning you cannot monetize the artwork in any respect and you have limited display rights. Check out vFriends. And the fourth is Creative Commons, where the artwork is placed in the public domain. This is the route the Moonbirds has gone recently. As of this moment, World of Women is the only collection in the top 25 projects based on implied market cap that has explicitly stated their intent to assign full copyright transfer directly to their holders through an IP assignment agreement, which is currently on a sixth version. Look. No matter how you slice it, this IP rights stuff can get messy. If only, if, if only there was a simpler way. Enter CC0. According to NFT Now, CC0, also known as the Creative Commons, means no rights reserved on intellectual property. It's a form of copyright that allows creators to waive legal interest in their work and move it into the public domain as far as possible. 
Unlike term bound, don't do this, can't do that, limited copyright licenses, CC0 licenses have zero restrictions and are irrevocable once granted. When a project goes CC0, there's no going back. The finality of this license alone is a benefit. Given the challenges and complexities with limited copyrights, many deem CC0 as the simplest, most permissive license available. By open sourcing the artwork to allow anyone to use it as they see fit, be it for commercial use, derivative collections, or any other means, the dominant supporting thesis predicts that it's far easier for a project to gain significant cultural penetration. Sherlock Holmes is often cited as demonstrating the power of public domain works, as it exploded in mindshare over the past two decades from multiple takes on the source material, including the BBC show, the Robert Downey Jr. films as well. Hell, even L stopped the nosebleeds in the remote viewing long enough to join in the investigative shenanigans. Come on, with so many distinct interpretations flooding the collective consciousness in such a short window of time, the brand has grown far more valuable and recognizable than would otherwise be possible without CC0. Just like IP licensing rights, though, CC0 licenses have their own drawbacks, the first being the lack of infringement protection. To be clear, you can still monetize works in the public domain, but you have no legal recourse to protect it from being copied or infringed. Just as with the Sherlock example, plenty of people successfully implement or leverage CC0 works within their commercial venture. Nevertheless, it's safe to assume that most savvy entrepreneurs would rather steer clear of driving commercial value towards an asset that they can't legally defend as their own. As stated at the onset, one of the core value propositions and motivators for purchasing or collecting an NFT is to own the associated artwork or IP. In a CC0 scenario, everyone has the same IP rights to the art, even if they don't own the NFT. With legally defensible protections out the window, the remaining value of owning the NFT has to emerge from token-centric utility, such as gated access, airdrops, staking, or similar chain-dependent activations. So long as the project keeps this incentive shift in mind, the NFT itself remains an attractive opportunity even without exclusive IP rights. After spending over a week and a half putting this together in an effort to simplify the intricacies of this whole subject, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. One of the deeper challenges starting to unravel is how art created using AI and machine learning will be handled. Precedent has been established in certain contexts, though, where, quote, the nexus between the human mind and creative expression as a prerequisite for copyright protection, end quote, renders non-human expression ineligible for copyright protection. But given the ascent of generative collections and tools like art blocks, I'm sure this will be a hotly contested topic in the coming decades. After spending many, many hours diving deep on this subject and really looking at the pros and cons of both options, I'm personally inclined to favor the exclusive unlimited license approach over CC0. Ultimately, I'm a free market capitalist and I believe in the power of incentives. On one hand, it seems to be the optimal option for creators working to coordinate efforts for the project in a way that grows the brand and entices new holders into the ecosystem. And on the other hand, collectors also win as they're empowered to capture direct value creation and overall brand appreciation. As early as we are in the adoption cycle of all of this, the collective conversation around and comprehension of IP rights in the context of NFTs and Web3 will have outsized impacts and implications on how these technologies, projects, and communities are designed, organized, incentivized, and distributed across time. If we want a more creative, innovative, equitable, and decentralized future for NFTs and Web3, we must take it upon ourselves to explore both approaches and appropriately apply our lessons going forward. This process is going to be challenging, but teams like Remaster are working on solutions and standards to decentralize terms and agreements in a way that adds a layer of legal clarity directly to NFTs. To learn more about what they're doing, how it works, and how they see this playing out, check out my interview with their CEO, Max Kernan, and co-founder and COO, Alex Modell. I'm Savon Springer, founder and managing partner of Native Assets, and I appreciate you.
Stay blessed, stay balanced. I'ma holler at you real soon. Peace.